Hello and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. This episode, we connect with a realtor and city council member, a discussion that looks at business from the eyes of others. During this episode, I would encourage you, the listener, to think deeply about your consumer, your target market. Mark Twain said a century ago, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that ain't so. Don't be fooled by what you know for sure about your consumer, yourself, your business, or the world. Go beyond simply asking a question and take time to observe and engross yourself in your consumer's world. There may be additional business opportunities that await. An excerpt from a book I am reading, Creative Confidence, No matter how high you rise in your career, no matter how much expertise you gain, you still need to keep your knowledge and your insights refreshed. Otherwise, you may develop a false confidence in what you already know that might lead you to the wrong decision. Take time to learn your consumer. Take time to learn their culture you may find business opportunities awaiting. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is a farmer, a volunteer, a Salem, Oregon City Council member. His community involvement spans from Latino businesses, budget committees, leadership councils, and more. Please welcome the owner of Urcasa Real Estate, Jose Gonzalez. All right, Jose Gonzalez, welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please, let's let's uh, introduce the world to Jose. Hey, good in my man. How are you? Good, good. Let's. Would love to kind of know, you know, your background. Yeah. Let's let's, let's talk about it. You know, I. I thought about it on the way here, right? And, you know, maybe this is the quickest way to get to know Jose. I'm basically like, you know what, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Mm. Will Smith and Carlton put together, <laughs> but as a Mexican. <laughs> That's me. That's me because I see myself in both um, both characters. And, you know, there are, one's in a new world. One is um, com- comfortable to that world they're in. And that's how I feel growing up as a Mexicano here in Oregon. That's how I feel. You know, a lot... There's a lot of rich history and culture that's through me, mm-hmm. and, but I'm in a different land, mm. you know, and, uh, but that's, I would say in a sense, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you what I'm not game. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a uh, college degree, degree holder. I'm not a um, professional speaker. Those are the things I'm not, you know, cause I know that's how we tend to introduce, introduce ourselves. And me, it's just, Someone that enjoys life every day, man. Yeah. You know, and if I'm not up against a struggle, I'm not comfortable. Mm, you know, so, so I mean, we'll, we'll go into a little bit and you'll start to see some of the things that I can look back and say I have, that have been accomplished between myself and my team and my family and friends. It's been that, that I'm always pushing. Yeah. Yeah, man. So that's me in a nutshell. So, so tu casa, yeah. real estate. How did, how did you begin that? How did we, how did that come evolve? Well, you know, so the founder, Mario Contreras, he's the one that sort of brought me in and mentored me for for my first few years before he retired and went back to Mexico and Mm -hmm. then Mexico didn't work out for him. So he's in Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, okay. Right. So he's just still doing real estate though. But for me, it was during the weird point of my life, Gabe, that I had dropped out of school, college to take care of my son. I was working at a restaurant, and when my son was sick, I couldn't go visit him. And my boss is like, Jose, this is what you wanted, management. Who's going to cover you? And I said, that's true. He was right. And I said, no, but something's wrong here. If I can't be there for my son, and 
I, I had this job for him. So it was just, it was like my world's colliding. It didn't right. make sense. So I said, I got to get, I got to do something that where I can control my time. And back then in 1997, I opened up the paper for all those that don't know, that's how you look for jobs. Was it classifieds? <laughs> and there was this little ad, the cheapest one you can get, probably free. Okay. Do you want to be a real estate agent? And I said, you know, we own nothing. You know, we, um, I knew nobody that owned real estate. All I saw was these characters on TV. Mm-hmm. And I said, it seems like they manage their own time. And man, that's been 23, 24 years now. That's crazy. Now you, you've yeah. come, so you, you mentioned you didn't own anything at that time because mm-hmm. you kind of came from some humble beginnings. Mm-hmm. Can you, let's talk about a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about your, your youth. Where did you come up? Well, you know, we've, um, the Willamette Valley, mm-hmm. Oregon, beautiful agricultural center of the state. And that's why my parents were here. We're farm workers. We were, um, that's my earliest job. I mean, my whole family getting out there. People will say farm working. Yeah, I used to go pick for my, for the summers to buy my school clothes. Yeah, we did that too. But literally for us, it was our whole family. My mom, dad, we were farm workers, you know, day until, and you worked until the, the job was done. Yeah. Um, and then from there, my dad got into different kinds of jobs. And I would say one of the key jobs, and this is where our lives intersect a little, is um, they got a call. They used to work with this convent back in the 70s. Mm, yep. And when they were going to open up this shelter for farm, basically, I mean, the best way is just homeless farm workers. I mean, really, yeah. that in, in today's words. But it was just a place for them to have, to be. Well, they, they, they realized, man, we're going to need someone bilingual. And so they remember my dad. And at that time we lived in Aurora and they called him. They said, Hey, we have this project. Do you want to come run it? And it wasn't just his decision. I mean, it was, but he pulled us all because what ended up happening is we happened to end up living on site, Mm. you know, and my dad managed that for 20 plus years. My mom was the one that handled the food program for 15 or so years my brother and I, those are our first job was just being there amongst 200 people, wow. you know, and um, yeah, that's, those are my early years, but farm worker and canneries, that's, that's what I did. So how did, how do you feel that kind mm-hmm. of shaped who we are today? Everything I do now, I think back to those times and I think, man, this seems hard. And then I'm like, oh no, not compared to that. Mm-hmm. So let's go forward. Um, risk, man, that seems risky. But then I'm like, well, we had nothing. We had zero. So what am I afraid of? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. So in a way, it's going back to those those moments where there is a potential barrier, a problem, a worry, a concern, or I feel there's maybe too much risk. I don't it goes away when I remember those those days Mm. because it feels like yesterday. Yeah. I mean, it does. Yeah. Now, one of the things you mentioned is, is, you know, Mm -hmm. you're not a public speaker. You don't have a college degree. Yeah. How did, how did you become successful? You know, one of the things, if I would say, um, this applies to everybody, but, you know, con- thinking of um, maybe who might be listening, game, right? Yeah. You know, you have a young entrepreneur, business, someone that wants to achieve more in life. One of the things that I realized and I, that I did without really, I wasn't planning this, right? But what I did is for 20 years or in my professional career in business and work, Gabe, I treated everybody with respect. Yeah. I didn't cross anybody. I didn't steal from nobody. I didn't take, I didn't hurt. I literally just treated people the way I expected to be treated, you know, because our families were so mistreated. So I would never do that to other people, you know, so that builds up. And then what happens? People that I ran into will call me. It doesn't really matter what you sell or what you do. If you build trust, they'll follow you. Yeah. They'll reach out to you. They'll look for you. And in this case, it just happened to be real estate, you know, but really it was just, it was just literally the way I treated people. Okay. That's the feedback I've gotten. Yeah. yeah. So, so when, when you, the founder of Tucasa left to Mexico, mm-hmm. did you kind of take over? How did you help build that Tucasa brand after th- this individual left? Yeah, it was a few of us. And, you know, just like anybody that works at a job, you always think you could do better than your boss or you have these ideas or, or he's not doing what he needs to do. That was me. <laughs> now, when he passed it to me, it, I sort of bought it from him. And uh, 
it's, I started doing all those things. The very first thing that he was upset with is I changed the logo. You know, the very first thing. <laughs> you know, he was just like, Jose, I hate that new logo. And I'm like, well, we need, <laughs> that's one of the things you do when there's a change. You know, you just, a pub, it's public facing. You know? yeah. And uh, and then from there, I just started re, um, you know, it's funny. The the face of a company, it really, it, it's, it's, it really means a lot in the community. Because in my uh, in my, uh, as I was, you know, developing my business there and building my relationships, they would always refer to Mario in this case mm-hmm. and whatever situation, reaction, relationship they have with Mario is how the, I felt I was treated. Right. So then what I did is, well, I thought, well, I need to go, um, re strengthen some of those relationships, create new ones, reconnect some lost ones, old ones. And, and it was through those first years that I just sort of learned where we were, where we were in the world where our little business fit in the community. And then I started taking steps to expand it, you know, and strengthen it and just go from the core, not ever trying to change what we were originally there for. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right? Yeah. And now, now tu casa is very specific because it kind of mm-hmm. helps Latinos in particular, right? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some of the struggles that, mm-hmm. that like, you've had to see through that part. And yeah. especially with Latinos trying to get into homes, what, what yeah. kind of barriers have they ran into? Or have you seen them run into? Oh yeah, and those those barriers continue. But the, I would say the here are some of the things that we really had to deal with um, uh, on a big scale when we first started, and that was, you know, we were really uh, you know up till now we're considered the, we're the most established, we're the oldest, I guess, fully bilingual off real estate office in Oregon, and those early days, you know, they would come to us, the families would come to us. You know, through it was either radio advertising, uh, word of mouth, us doing community events that they come out to us. And then what we would do is we'd have to take it's like a big puzzle. We'd have to take the pieces that they're bringing. Right. And then we'd have to make it work to for them to achieve their dream of home ownership. And here are some of the pieces they didn't have. They didn't have completed tax returns. Right. So we had to send them to a tax person. They didn't have banks, bank accounts. So we had to find a bank banker that was willing to help them through the process. They have, they had, they had zero credit because they believed in cash. Their culture says, don't trust the banks. So we had to, we had to imagine this, imagine this, a low income Latino Spanish speaking family game that had never taken out a loan in their life, not even for $2,000. And here we are having to convince them to take a hundred thousand dollar 30 year debt. Yeah. Education. It was education. bro. Yeah. That was the first part. And then bilingual, there were bilingual nobody. There was no bilingual loan officer, escrow officers, uh, inspectors, underwriters, processors, zero. So we had to be their point of contact through the whole process above and beyond really what we should be doing. But we had to, we had no choice. Yeah. yeah. So is that kind of sounds like that's kind of how you, you know, one of the things I talked about mm-hmm. in the previous episode is culture and how, how culture kind of helps create your strategy. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Did that essentially define the brand for tu casa? It did. I mean, it literally did because no matter what we did as far as marketing and we try to expand into different, in different areas, the people identified us that way, you know? So that's, that's what I mean is even though we've done some other things along the way, you know, we've always stayed true to that core, even to this day. A meeting I had yesterday, same thing. It was just they're looking for somebody that I can understand mixed immigration status families, um, multiple jobs, seasonal jobs, um, a lot of savings, no credit or low credit. All these things that, um, you know, we might as well be back in day one. Yeah. You know, it's just and that's and it's it's just but it's super rewarding. I can't, I mean, it's just the impact we've made in our neighborhoods. is just, it's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So, so some of the things you mentioned earlier about building the brand, mm-hmm. you know, community events, radio, mm-hmm. how did you build the brand so big that you actually were, were on the New York times, mm-hmm. right? You were, you were, uh, you featured in the New York times. How did you build a mm-hmm. Tucasa brand so big that it was noticed all the way across in New York? Yeah. You know, the, in that situation, it was interesting because Here's a sort of a good example of what I'm talking about. People, one of our owners at that time, partial owners, 
he also owned property in Puerto Vallarta. So we would get these phone calls and asking if we could help them with that. And I said, well, no, I mean, we're in, we're based in Salem, Oregon. But the cost kept coming in that we said, well, maybe we should do something. And, you know, sure enough, we found out through our, our the real estate law that we could help somebody, you know, um, through the process, even though the property was in a different location, literally outside the country. Right. And for so for a while there. Uh, so anyway, so we focused on this. Initially, Gabe, it was people wanting to buy in the coastal areas, Puerto Vallarta. I mean, that's what you think, you know, buying in Mexico. Everybody thinks the coast. And so that's what we thought, too. But what I did, it was really funny. I toured some property in Acapulco. It's right on the beach. So I took this awesome picture, right? Right on the on the balcony. And then what I did is I brought it back and I made like a little flyer that says, we can help you buy a property in Mexico. But we were, th- we were talking half a million dollar house. We were talking, you know, these kind of properties. But since I put it on my desk, all my clients were coming in and saying, wait, you buy in Mexico? Well, I'm from Michoacan and blah, blah, blah. I'm from Jalisco, blah, blah. I'm from uh, Mojaca. And, and then... I told the other guys in the office, I go, you know, I think there's something here because it seems like they want to buy, they want to go back, they want to invest in Mexico, but they don't trust anybody, but they trust us, right? So it just led to us eventually having an office in Mexico City. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was there. Um, so we had somebody there that um, we had a contact with title companies. We had um, somebody there that was willing to be that connect and knew how to do business in Mexico because it's different. And through that, because we were the one of the only companies back then that was promoting properties in Mexico, it was all the radio. It was radio back then. And um, we were really the only company that was doing it on the interior. In other words, we were offering properties in Guadalajara, in Morelos, in um, a little bit. Um, we were about to get into Michoacan in some of those smaller towns. And we're talking houses, Gabe, that were... Twenty fifteen thousand dollars to sixty thousand. Oh That's, wow! Yeah, it was just, wow. and there was mortgages. You could get a if you were a Mexicano living in the U.S., you can get a house. This is how it worked out. You can get a fifty thousand dollar house with five thousand down and five hundred dollars a month, and you can pay it from Woodburn, Oregon, wow. right? Because they gave you an account number. So it was this awesome, and it's still it's still out there. Um, but because of that, we ended up connecting with this uh, architecturally famous house in Mexico City. They were looking for a buyer, them knowing that they had to go outside of the country. And then as soon as we started to advertise that property, bam, the New York Times just happened to be looking into what was a real estate crash doing in Mexico City, in Mexico. And so they found this as the right op- right opportunity to, to share a story um, by featuring this property and interviewing us. So it was just it was just us, like I said, digging deep into our business, helping the people that have been helping us since day one. And uh, yeah, that's how it turned out. I mean, it was just literally doing what nobody was doing. Wow. You know, one of the things you talked about too is um, how much community work, you know, giving back to the community. You you do quite a bit of community. In fact, you're also a city councilman, mm-hmm. correct? Now let's, let's talk about your community work. What kind of inspired you to do uh, community work? You know, it, it really just, I always go back to the way my parents were treated and knowing that for whatever reason, their lack of English, their, the way they dressed, you know, they, the way they were treated wasn't always what I would consider um, the way it should be. Right. And looking at, uh, it was around the time that the real estate crash in seven, eight, nine, that I realized that if our community is not doing well, then our business never will, you know? So then we just started giving back. And initially Gabe, it was, what you think of physically. In other words, Habitat for Humanity, picking up a hammer, feeding the homeless, you know, sandwiches, and you take them to this. There's an area under the bridge in Salem that has, you know, so you think of all those things as far as volunteering, you know, cleaning up the streets, all those things. But what happened was, as we were out there doing those things, people were like, wait a minute, so you have an awareness, a knowledge of financing, real estate, basic law, basic tenant law, um, you know, all those things that we all helped our parents navigate through, you know. Um, and so then we started getting in, asked to translate, interpret, volunteer for many things. One of them is, you know, entrepreneurship, teaching someone how to, because uh, back then they didn't have this curriculum in Spanish and then there's very little today, but they needed someone to grab that information and put it in, translate it into Spanish. And so it, that's where it started, Gabe. It was just us giving back because we, we, we knew we had to help our community somehow. 
And it was just simple things, but it just added up and it just kept going and it's still going. I mean, we're still getting asked to volunteer and do things um, because it's just the, the need is only greater. Yeah. Today. And so, so that volunteer, right. You, you volunteering kind of eventually progressed into becoming or, or mm-hmm. um, going for a city council position. Right. Correct. How did that kind of, uh, you know, turn or how did that kind of come about? Anybody that volunteers, I could tell you, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. If you really are there genuinely to help, right. Then eventually someone's going to say to you, you know what, you should, you should, you should run for office. You should run for city council. You should run for school board. You should, these comments are natural because we're better. You know, they always say there's three kinds of people that run for office. The first one is the one that's doing it for vanity for themselves. You know, number two is single issue people. There's sometimes there's one issue that's just has someone so passionate. They want to run for office. The third is the people you have to ask, right? So guess, this is exactly what somebody told me, guess which ones should be politicians. It's the ones you have to ask. Right. So, you know, they, they kept asking me and Gabe, I, and in my mind, I'm thinking never. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, I feel bad saying no, but I would always say, well, maybe one day I just, and that's how it was. I mean, the day I decided to run for city council, the day before I would have said, Jose, you're crazy to run. But I woke up one day. And I said, you know, I think um, I'm at that point in my life where the kids, I have two older ones, which are, you know, moving on in the world, two younger ones that there's a nice, there's a nice little, I have a nice little space for the next couple of years where um, I can afford to have a little more time, give back a little more. I feel like I'm aware of what's going on the city level. And uh, I felt I could win. I mean, that was it. If I didn't feel like I could win, I wouldn't run. But I thought to myself, I can win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you won. I won. And you won. (laughs) Congratulations. Now, how you, one of the things you also mentioned was, you know, your family, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's one of the things, you know, business professionals struggle with. What advice do you have about balancing, Mm -hmm. you know, work, you know, volunteering, community life and and your family? I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll um, probably explain to you sort of my philosophy, but we, we, uh, the the Salem Chamber of Commerce had this um, lunch with leaders and there's this fellow named, um, um, Jerry Frank in Salem. Right. And, and I I asked him the same thing. I said, Jerry, and his story is something else, but I asked him, I go, how do you balance work, family and community? How do you balance that? And he says, Jose, um, I know why you're asking me that, but you're asking me the wrong question. And then I, and then I'm, Oh, interesting. He goes, there's only one thing that you should focus on. And that's your health. Because the other three, you're going to just do the best you can, man. One day you're going to work too much. One day you're going to be with your family too much. One day you're just going to be out there volunteering. with. But if you don't have your health, you can't do either of those. None of those. Yeah, right? good point. You know, and so then that's really, I would say, probably my main focus is taking care of myself. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, I have to talk to my kids and let them know, yeah, I'm your, I'm your father, but I'm a man. I'm a human first. Nice. I need to feel healthy. Yeah. And if I'm tired, you got to give me a minute. You know, if I'm, um, if I'm uh, um, needing extra time, trust me, you know, and I tell them everything, you know, and what's nice. I mean, I, and luckily I have this privilege now is that, you know, things are written about me or I'm in this article, things come up that they can see for themselves, you know, that they know that I'm not out there wasting my time. Yeah. Yeah. Now has, have you felt at any point in time, either Mm -hmm. in your business or or Mm -hmm. yourself, any like self doubt where you felt like, man, Mm -hmm. am I making the right decision? Yeah. I mean, almost every day, you know, almost every day there's see, cause I mean, especially as a small business owner, Gabe, it's your money on the line it's time you're not going to get back, you know? So it's literally, you know, I mean, there were some times where I'm thinking, man, if it's either this flyer, this advertisement, or man, if this doesn't work out, there's no Disneyland this year. I mean, it's, if, if I do, if I don't make this, there might not be dinner today. I mean, it's, 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 those are the kind of decisions that um, for me are real, you know? So that's how, that's where, um, that's where I have to make those decisions every day. And, 
you have, I mean, I'm not saying that. And sometimes I do. I think sometimes one of my issues is I, I doubt myself a little too much just because of some hard times that I've been through. Right. So that's natural because of what I've been through. Right. But it's um, but now it's helping me because I'm a little more cautious as where I was younger. You know, I went for bro. I mean, I was I had zero fear, man, yeah. you know, and that's not the best thing to do sometimes when you have a family that's depending on you. You know, so what would you say is, you know, looking back on it, what would you say is like the one thing you like one pivotal moment for you that you kind of notice in that moment, this, I made the right decision. Oh, right decision. You know, um, oh, I'll tell you right now, you know, it's funny. I've never been asked that, but I know the moment. That's a tough one. It's a good one though, but my older two, right? Maybe about three years ago, two, three years ago, I asked them, Hey, J- JJ and jazz, you know, I go, Hey, JJ jazz. What, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? I mean, count on me. Cause you know, they were, Young people coming out of the recession where jobs, it was a crazy transition where, you know, these young people were go apply online. And so they're applying hundreds. I mean, it was just a mess. It's still a mess, I think. But I asked them, what is that you want to be? You know what they both said, Gabe? They said, oh, we want to be like you. And it was just, I couldn't believe it. And I said, I I just didn't expect that. And and they're like, well, and then they started naming it. I'm like, why? I mean, I didn't. The why wasn't because I was trying to get some data and trying to find out. No, no. It was like, like, why? You know, why? What did you see? And it was really nice what they said, you know. And um, then I said, man. And so that gave me a fuel, you know. Yeah. If I wasn't on fire before, man, it was just after that. And just I think about that a lot. Yeah. That's awesome. That's that's amazing, you know, mm-hmm. when you're able to be your heroes to your kids. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. a that's a big thing. Yeah. What what advice, you know, your kids are younger. Right. What did, what advice would you give to the younger generation? The main thing I teach them is learn about money. Now, I don't mean money like go chase it. And the, I'm talking about we value time. We equate time and money. You know, we work forever for money. We we want to get good uh, grades in school because one day we want to get a good job to get better money. Money is such a uh, important part of our lives. Even the ones that say that it isn't it's probably more important for them than for people like me. Money is not important to me. And I'm not saying, but it's the concept. In other words, I'm striving for a great life, right? And then the money comes. If I was chasing the money, which I mean, I did for a long time, right? So that's my thing. I teach them about where money came from, why, question everything, you know, and they realize it. I tell them, hey, look, at, does, this, does this moment of happiness, whatever it may be that we're experiencing, does it cost money? No. They're like, no. Okay, then just keep that in mind as you live your life. So, yeah. What, what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, that's a, oh, that's a good one. You know, um, if anything, to have, to give my younger self a little peace, Gabe, is just to let me know if I could just go and peek in there for a few minutes and talk to myself. I'd be like, Hey man, you're on the right track. Relax. Keep doing what you're doing. Cause you know, this, this country teaches you to keep climbing a ladder that maybe may or may not be there. Right. And then you climb it forever. Right. But if you know, you're on the right track or you you think you're doing the best you can that day, that's what I did every day. At some point I just said, you know what? I did the best I could today. I'm going to forget about it, enjoy a movie with my kids. I'm not even going to think about it because it was that little climbing the ladder thing that, I mean, if that takes you, that could take over your life and it does for a lot of people, you know, and at some point I I gave up on that thought process and it was just literally telling myself, man, if I could, yeah, tell myself it's just that relax, you're doing the right thing. Just those two words. I wish someone would have told me. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back on it, Al. Looking, you know, the last yeah. years of your life, would you do it all again? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, if, if I, if I'm, there's no way I'm going to be on my bed, Gabe, mm-hmm. not knowing that I didn't suffer, that I bled, that I cried, that I had super success. I want to feel all of those extremes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to feel them all. And so, you know, I look back and I mean, yeah, you know, man, scars from the past. I mean, yeah. hard. I love them. I enjoy them, you know, because I got to experience and I'm here today. 
And I just tell people, make mistakes, man. I fall hard. Like sometimes I drive and I'll see a car, right? And the the back window's crack, you know, cracked. Uh, there's a dent in the side. It's running. The people look nervous. I'm like, I like to see that. Not in a bad way, but like, man, they're they're in that moment right now. It's deep for them. It's a real struggle, you know, and just and it just every, everybody has to experience that. Yeah. Yeah. You you uh, definitely get molded mm-hmm. by the struggle, right? You That's get true. forged by the fire. That's true. So what so how let's let's uh you know, how do how do people get in contact with you? How do they figure out where tu casa is? You have a website, how can they get in contact with Jose? No, you don't. Easy, man. You just Jose Gonzalez, you just look it up on Google. Jose Gonzalez Salem, Jose Gonzalez tu casa. I'm up there, man. I'm one of those. You know, so it won't, I won't be too hard to find. You know, I'm pretty much in every social media um out there. So just real easy to get a hold of. I'm always open. I'm always willing Perfect. to help. Perfect. Yeah, man. Jose, thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook.